Good, I think we can go ahead and get started. Um, again, welcome to today's webinar, What Makes a Successful RTO from Services to Technology. Happy to bring you two amazing speakers today, Ashley Alberry, the Chief Operating Officer for Maptician. Hi, Ashley, and Nick Rapaz, VP Outsourcing Sales for Solutions. Hey, Nick. Okay, let's take a look at what we're gonna be talking about today. So of course, we're gonna to get to know Nick and Ashley a little bit, but then we're gonna get into some market data, what's going on with return to office trends, looking at utilization, compliance, tech trends, models, peer seeking behaviors. Um, and then we're gonna look at the putting services and technology together and what that looks like. But first let's get to know uh, our speakers a little bit, Ashley. So, um, thank you, Trish. Uh, my name is Ashley Alberry, and I am so excited to be here today. And it's so wonderful to see so many familiar names and even a few faces in the photos. I see clients, I see partners, I see uh, several employees, and it's just awesome to see you all here. I'm also thrilled to be with Nick. Uh, this is a kind of a topic that's near and dear to my heart, actually, which is kind of funny because most of you on the call know me from the product side, but services is kind of where my roots are. So services and product coming together is just really exciting to me, and I'm really happy to bring this topic to you today. So my role at Maptician is Chief Operating Officer, but I am very heavily involved in the revenue side of our business today. So really bringing different verticals to market, particularly in professional services, which is where I may know many of you from. And so you're going to see on that right-hand side, 61% of our business today at Maptician is made up of professional services firms, whether that be legal, accounting, financial services, and the like. But as you can see, we serve pretty much any type of client. And so it really kind of just gets in to how people use the tool and in this case services combined. So I'm going to talk about that today. I also want to just familiarize those who are on the call with Maptician a little bit if you don't know who we are. Um, so we are the hybrid office tool. So today we're talking about hybrid. We are the tool that enables hybrid. I love to think that people help that, which we're going to talk about today. But if you are thinking of hybrid, you're probably thinking of seat management, conference room management, who's in the office, who's planning to be in the office, are my friends in the office, and then really trying to manage that across maybe even multiple locations. So that's Maptician. That's what we enable. And I'm going to talk a lot about that today. You're going to see some survey data also throughout the presentation today. We have some really great surveys in legal and financial services right now that is very current data showing us exactly what's happening in the space. And we know very directly that 10.5% of People's revenue right now is going to space sometimes very much underutilized to the effect of under 50% utilization. So we're going to talk about that today. And you're going to see some differences between industries. And I know we have several people on the call from different industries. So I hope you can gain um, insights from different industries and maybe even think outside of yours. I think that's kind of the beauty of today. With that, I'm actually going to turn it over to my friend Nick to introduce himself and Forest Solutions. Thanks a lot, Ashley. Uh, hi, everybody. Good afternoon and good morning. My name is Nick Rapaz. I'm VP of Outsourcing and Client Services uh, for Forest Solutions. So uh, introducing myself, I've got 15 plus years of experience supporting organizations that are looking to you know, optimize or modernize their support services, uh, you know, explore cost savings initiatives or you know, in today's world, completely transform their offerings uh, to support demanding professionals, no matter what industry they're in. So a little bit about Forest Solutions. Uh, we consider ourselves to be experts in what we call people-powered solutions. Uh, our group is insanely dedicated to staying in our lane and bringing the highest possible level of service to the areas that we care about, and that's delivering the best version of on-site support possible. Uh, you know, we don't sell equipment. We don't develop technology like Ashley, and, you know, we don't send work to delivery centers around the world. Uh, our focus is on sourcing, training, and managing people who are really there to make an impression on your office and on your culture. Um, so, you know, looking at this slide, you know, we've been in business for 47 years. Uh, a large component to, of Forest Solutions is our uh, the staffing side of our company. Um, we support legal, corporate, and advisory across the board. 
Uh, we have a 97% client retention rate, which is almost unheard of uh, in the space of being uh, a business partner across the different industries that are represented today. But, uh, you know, our what we're trying to bring to the marketplace right now, post pandemic, is an offering that we call WPX, Workplace Experience. And we're going to talk a bit more uh, about that later. But we feel like post or during the pandemic, you know, we made a conscious decision to pivot in the direction of providing the a heightened level of service within our client operations. And we were really pioneers in this service that we call workplace experience. Um, so yeah, we're looking forward to uh, talking through multiple industries with you. And, you know, with that, I'll give it back to Trish. Awesome. Thanks, Nick. All right. So let's dig in. Um, uh, and actually, before we do, I just want to make a mention here. Please feel free to utilize the chat um, anytime, you know, questions for Nick, questions for Ashley, general questions, thoughts, comments. We're more than happy to hear your feedback as we progress through today's presentation. Um, okay, so here we go. Five-day office week is dead. I, I bet a lot of people on this webinar today saw that article in the New York Times. It was about a week ago from Stanford economist Nick Bloom. Um, how about, what are you guys seeing, Nick and Ashley, uh, on the ground in your clients uh, across verticals? Yeah, so, you know, regarding the market, um, probably more than most, you know, our team has been watching the trend in this data for the last couple of years and, you know, following the work of people like Nick Bloom, who you just mentioned. And, you know, for me and the rest of the, you know, data geeks who care uh, deeply about return to office stats, uh, it's been really interesting to watch the trends develop across, you know, each geography, uh, each industry vertical, and in some cases, uh, the seniority levels, you know, within the firms that we support as it relates to the frequency that people are coming back to the office. So, you know, return to office strategies are all over the place. And we're going to talk about that uh, in length as well during this discussion. But, you know, the one universal trend is that compliance for whatever is rolled out by each company or firm, you know, is low. Uh, mandates without teeth are really only suggestions and firms so far have been apprehensive to establish hard lines because of the impact it might have on recruitment or culture for that matter. Um, you know, occupancy rates continue to be low uh, or lower than what we were used to in 2020 with a slight trend moving upward. But that trend is, it's hard to take seriously because it's really leveling off as time goes on. 50% uh, occupancy in comparison to you know 2020 is really the new normal. And you know, not to overuse a phrase that is significantly overused, but you know, as we know, the largest line item for any firms or, or company's budget uh, behind their people is their real estate. And there's a strong, strong correlation right now uh, between a firm's official decision to change attend attendance expectations and the timing of their lease renewal. And, you know, I, I think it's, you know, Nick Bloom is a genius in this area, but I think it's safe to say that landlords and property managers probably know a lot more about the future of return to office than Nick Bloom ever will. You know, these firms are making decisions based on their leases being up. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, looking at the financial and professional services side of things, one thing that is apparent is that work from home is now an expectation where before it was an exception with a lot of these organizations. And, you know, a lot of the reasons that people actually enjoy visiting the office are coming to light as a result. Um, you know, when it comes to the technology side of it, actually, I suppose, you know, you're more of an authority on this uh, than I am. So what do you think? Yeah, well, there's three things just as you were talking and some things that you and I had talked about before that I think I'd bring up here. First of all, I think the 48% is actually fairly consistent with the real data that we have from the Maptician side. So when we look at space, we're not only just looking at seats and rooms and the attributes within a floor plan, we're actually looking at how people utilize all of that. And so we we're seeing around that 48%, I would say a little bit here and there on each end, but I think that that's fairly consistent. 
The utilization is really interesting to me, though, because even when we're reporting on that, it can be very different based on geographic location within different offices. So you may have an office who is who are rather mostly in office and have one that is fully hoteling. And in our case and in our experience, that's okay as long as you understand the entire picture. So the analytics side, understanding the entire picture of all offices, all locations, how they prefer to operate, the return to office strategies, and having all of that be brought together, I think is incredibly important. Uh, the other thing that's really interesting to me that came out of this, Nick, is that the usage of technology, a lot of organizations have not adopted new technology. And we kind of had that as a thought, but seeing this actual data, I think is really interesting where the majority have not adopted anything new. Now of those, there's in all 13% are using Outlook to manage a lot of these things. So when I say that, you know, we all use Outlook for the most part, um, depending on industry, but for the most part, but for seat booking, conference room management and things like that, there are still people trying to manage that through Outlook, which is just a nightmare. And I know some of the people I've talked to are on this call and we've talked about this. It's like, I'm trying to use Visio, I'm trying to use Outlook, I'm trying to use all these different tools that I already have in my toolbox, but nothing's working. And so I think then people get a little bit stuck there and then they don't implement anything. And that's what we're seeing in this data. So I think that's what I would say from the technology side. But I think then born are the new models, if you will. So the new models of work, and I know we have three of them we're going to talk about here today. Um, I would say these are at a high level, the three models. And we see the exact same thing here, 100% in office, fully remote or hybrid. That probably seems pretty obvious to everybody on this call because you probably know a little bit about this topic. I will say within each of those categories, there are kind of subcategories where 100% in office may not mean 100% in office every day. It may mean you have to be in that office and you have to be a certain number of days, um, but you're maybe not there every day. Fully remote is probably pretty consistent, but I would even argue there that fully remote probably always has been fully remote, meaning those employees have been fully remote for a long time, um, or there are organizations who are adopting a little bit more of that with certain departments. Um, so I know there's some people on the call that I've heard, you know, certain departments are even that they were fully remote, but now they're even asking mm -hmm. them to come back. So I think well, you're going to see subcategories evolve over time. Nick, did you have something there? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, not to interrupt. I mean, no, it's, it's great. funny. I was I was just speaking with a, a, a friend in the industry this morning in legal, yeah. uh, the firm Hush Blackwell. You know, they have a fully virtual office that they refer to as the link. And yeah. over, I, I, I don't know if it's over 200, but roughly 200 of their attorneys yeah. are 100% dedicated to that virtual office. That virtual yeah. office has a managing partner. That virtual office has a dedicated administrator. And I think they were working on this stuff prior to COVID. So they, they were probably mm -hmm. a little more prepared than, than other firms that we know in the industry. But that has probably been one of their more successful models in recent years. So it, it's just another example of a pivot that firms can take. That's actually a really, really great point. There's technology now that's supporting that exact use case. So we have clients, for example, who will say, we are going to continue to have 200 remote employees. I don't care what you say, what the model is, there will be remote employees. And so what we're doing to kind of manage what you just described is we would take what we would traditionally call a floor plan, but we would create a remote or fully remote floor plan so that you can still see that office, if you will, that remote office digitally and see when people are in office when they're actually working, when they pinged into Microsoft in our case or something of that nature. So you're taking that fully adopted Hush Blackwell model, but then you're taking it a step further, digitizing it and saying, now I can see that virtual place, which I think that's going to help over time because as we're going to talk about later, it's all about visibility. I don't know if you'd agree with that, Nick, but I think it's kind of neat that you just heard that and we're implementing that exact yeah. scenario. It was it was very timely to have that discussion uh, in the last couple of hours. But yeah, no, I agree with you. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, I think there's some there's actually a lot of things happening with different firms right now and different companies, regardless of industry. And so we wanted to actually just do a quick poll. Um, you know, if you've been on any of our webinars before, you know, we love a good poll. So if you could just answer these questions, I think there's two of them. 
The first being what model of hybrid is your firm or company using? And then the second on a scale of one to 10, how successful is your model? Now, I will tell you, when we were prepping for this, there's some bets on what the answers will be. Nick thinks he's going to win. I think I'm going to win. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's going to owe me five bucks. I'm, I'm just, I'm just uh, leaning on Nick Bloom's industry data at this point. So, Dang, I playing, think I'm going to owe you. Are we doing prices right you. rules? Or, or, <laughs> can, um, I a dollar? can I go down to one? I think so. Let's give everybody a second here. I guess, you know, not surprising here, 95% are hybrid. And this is kind of where we're seeing everything going and what everybody's interested in today. So we kind of expected to see that answer. 100% uh, in office is a little bit unique, but there are a lot of really cool tools to manage 100% in office as well. Uh, so 96% hybrid. And we're a little split on how successful is the model. We only have one person, though, who's saying a nine. Everybody else is seven or below. So... And look, we want these to be successful. We want to get to the nines. I think in general, my thought was we'd be at a five because everybody says, eh, it's okay. Um, but looks like we're spread a little bit here. So I'm going yeah, with not surprising. Right. Not yeah, not surprising <laughs> considering the data that we have. And thankfully, th these were the answers because the rest of our slides would be useless if they disagreed with us. Uh, so true. But, but you know, this, this is a great graphic that, We've used uh, over the last couple of webinars, and we've used this in some of the publications that you know Forest Solutions has put out. That you know, on-site is really the new office, and you know what what does that actually mean? Um, you know, it, it's it's quite powerful, and it understands how our it, it helps us understand how minds have changed. You know, since March of 2020, the office used to be a place where you know, every category of work was done, or at least, you know, most of it. Uh, but the great reset that happened after people and organizations were folk, uh, forced to work remotely, you know, for extended periods of time, sent shockwaves through every workplace norm that we had. And it really created, you know, years of future stress for everybody who logged into this call today, because most of you are probably in charge of supporting, you know, the office. But, you know, as you can see, pre-pandemic, it focused work, all of the things, you know, the, the head down, you know, research, going through data, doing expense reports, approving expense reports, things like that. All of that was always done in the office, but now it's more reserved for those days that people are traditionally working from home, Mondays and Fridays, uh, where Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday turns into collaboration time. People try to get to the office at the same time as their practice leaders or you know, as their COO or CFO in many cases. And it, it really has changed the industry um, quite a bit for the better, for the worse, you know, that every, every firm can be the judge of that. But um, it, it's just a really powerful graphic for us to understand it. Trish. And I actually will chime in here uh, with this, what if anything drives people back into the office? So what we're seeing and what we have seen for the past, I will call it 18 months, are people make the entire difference. So people are the key here and really offering an opportunity for people to be with their peers and be with them and get that, not even just be with them, but the energy and the drive-by conversations. I always talk about the drive-by conversations. You miss those entirely if you are not in the office. Now, I will say, if I say that in a meeting or something like that, so he's like, yeah, that's why I don't come in because those are annoying. But at the same time, you can actually get some serious work done if we have these little tiny conversations and they bring a little bit of energy to everybody. So I think we're talking a lot about this right now. I will say 73% and above is really monumental here. And that's what we're looking at. And all of these involve, involve people. It's my leads, it's my peers, it's my practice group, it's my department. It's just the people I like being around that are making the difference of coming into the office or not. Nick, do you have anything on this topic? I think people are key in our case, but I assume that to be true in your case. <laughs> yeah, I resoundingly agree with you. And just from personal experience, you know, I've, yeah. I've spent the better part of the last 10 years working remotely just because of the nature of my work, where headquarters is for the organizations that I've worked for. You know, I live in Minnesota. The rest of my team, for the most part, is in New York City. And 
there is a certain energy. I, I, I try to explain it to people in the office that when I visit, it recharges my batteries, which makes zero yep. sense to somebody who's used to being in the office every day. But there is a lot of truth to it. And I think yeah. when all of us were forced to you know, do the work from home thing, uh, you folks really started to um, appreciate the, the time that they had with their colleagues in the office. And we have to find the happy medium somehow. So, um, yeah. Now you have more so, data here. Yeah, more data. So this is actually our data. Forest Solutions uh, conducted a survey this year that was sent out to hundreds of operations leaders and executives. And, you know, probably some of you on this call responded to it, but we really tried to get to the bottom of, you know, what the industry is trending toward in regards to return to office. Um, you know, so as long as I have worked in outsourcing, especially for professional services and, you know, long before that, uh, every industry, whether it's you know, legal, advisory, consulting, finance, et cetera, et cetera, uh, everybody kind of always followed their own industry trend. Uh, law firm A would always wait for law firms B and C to see overwhelming success in some kind of initiative before they would ever consider dipping their toes in the water. Uh, or on the flip side, they would just forever be set in their ways no matter what. Uh, that has not happened uh, with return to office initiatives. Every firm kind of had to figure out what was best for them in the moment uh, as soon as people were allowed to come back. And it's led to mixed results, uh, especially at the onset. And now we're all kind of funneling to the same place where everyone's working three days a week. Uh, and you know, for the sake of this survey, uh, and because the marketplace you know was so fragmented in its approach toward getting back to the office, you know, we suspected answers would be all over the place. But it taught us a lot about what's working, and more importantly, that there's no silver bullet for earning participation from people who now have the expectation to come back. Um, and really, most firms have seen success through incremental change. So, you know, just looking at the data. Uh, of the firms uh, and organizations that we surveyed, 93% of them were doing some kind of hybrid schedule, much like everybody on this call. Uh, the return policies were all over the place. You know, They were either strongly suggested, mandated, or there was just no policy at all. But the one consistent, or there were two consistent things. Uh, first, no matter what your mandate was or your strong suggestion, you were never going to see the top end of it. If you said be in the office two to three, uh, people were only coming in one or two days. Uh, if you mandated uh, four plus, you were only getting three. Uh, and, and the other thing that these firms had in common is no matter what, 94% of firms just weren't seeing compliance across the board. So our secondary questions were really, you know, what have you done to entice people back to the office? And of all of those firms, 87.5% made at least one change. And of the firms that did make a change, they saw incremental improvements. Uh, in this case, all the way up 18% increase in the amount of time people are spending in the office. You know, surprise, surprise, if you make the office somewhere pleasant to visit, people are actually going to come back. Um, so, you know, this included, you know, redesigned floor space, adding amenities, uh, hospitality, which we will cover at length later, um, but also the scariest word uh, in, in uh, operations, hoteling. Uh, it's really, it's been a lightning rod for some firms, but frankly, you know, it's been the most effective way to communicate or send the signal to your professionals that change is here to stay. Uh, you know, however, it's, you know, not something that can be done in a half measure. Uh, you can't just implement a hoteling policy with a few shared desks and reservation technology or outlook, you know, with the exception that you're going to see the kind of success that you've read about, you know, in, you know, the New York Times or any other publication that covers, you know, return to office. Um, at Forest, you know, we have literally dozens of examples of either assisting our clients at the onset of a hoteling initiative or joining up with them shortly after they made that implementation themselves. And you know, with confidence, and we, we say this a lot, 100% um, of the firms and organizations that we work with who implemented some kind of hoteling program 
nobody regrets it. Nobody regrets making that jump. And the suggestion from us when firms come to us for guidance is to start small and do it with the correct support structure in place. So uh, Trish, can you go to the next slide? For Yes, here we go. Uh, it's hoteling, not motelling. Uh, a colleague of mine just released an article uh, with this exact title and it's, it's too cheeky for me not to use. But <laughs> what we're trying to say is you have to match the policy with the means to support it. Uh, you know, we've all stayed or heard from someone who's you know, had to spend a night in a flea bag motel. And even if you hadn't, haven't, I think Hollywood has done a pretty good job depicting the horrors of spending the night in one, you know, creaky floors, a shady front desk attendant, nothing but a vending machine, uh, maybe one of those beds that shake when you feed it quarters. You know, we all know, we all know the motel uh, moniker, but, you know, on the flip side of that, and the more important piece is that we've all either felt it or heard from friends who have experienced a lux the luxury associated with staying at a Ritz Carlton or a JW Marriott or any other recognized luxury hotel. Um, you know, we only we only ever visit those places for a small percentage of our week or month, just like professionals only visit the office one, two, three days a week. But the experience associated with it typically sets the tone for the trip you know, whether it's personal or business, you feel taken care of, you feel safe, you you absorb the culture of the environment that you're in. And most of all, you develop a habit of wanting to go back someday. And, you know, just because I'm an advocate for outsourcing doesn't mean that this needs to be an outsourcing initiative. Um, firms by themselves can adopt several practices that'll incrementally get them to earning back, you know, the commute from your professionals. Uh, so next slide, Trish. So <clears throat> at Forest, our very organized attempt at creating this environment on behalf of our clients is something we call workplace experience or WPX. And it follows you know, three categories of support. You can see here meet and greet, guest transition and destination. When you arrive, you have a badge waiting for you. You have a lobby concierge who brings you to the correct floor. Um, it is a very professional feeling experience. You feel like you're supposed to be there um, in terms of guest transition. Uh, a floor host, a floor ambassador or a receptionist, they are expecting you. They're asking you questions. Are you going to need a secondary space today? Do you have clients that are visiting? You know, they want, we want to get all of this information so we are prepared for your day. And then in terms of destination support, making sure that we have people waiting on your beck and call uh, with first level IT support, being a workplace concierge, somebody who can help you, you know, navigate the, the new version of the office, get you a lunch or dinner reservation somewhere, um, provide you know, support for food and beverage. Um, there's so much that goes into it. And you know, like I said a few moments ago, the spirit of it is, that we are all about earning back that commute. It's another way of saying um, that, you know, to ensure, to earn these unsure professionals back to the office, we need to compete with the comforts that they have at home. So when they visit the office, the experience doesn't need to be perfect, but it's gotta be pretty close. And if it's not, it's gonna become easy to forget about the firm's, you know, suggestion uh, to visit the office every Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. And that's what's happening. I mean, if we look back at the data and, you know, who wants to get in their car or get on the train, commute 30 to 60 minutes, get into an office that's a ghost town. It's 25% full, 50% full. You walk by a, a quiet stranger at reception, sit down just to look around, not see another soul in sight, and just think about how busy things used to be four years ago or three years ago. And the whole time you're watching the clock, just waiting to start your awful commute home again. It's a bad reality in comparison to visiting a site that has been deliberately rethought. Um, and the role of the office has to be more like the experiences that they are willing to sacrifice their commute for. So my next slide, we have some examples actually of WPX initiatives. So we've implemented all of these at one point or another on behalf of our clients across the AMLA, advisory, financial services, and corporate. And you know, looking at each category, it's fairly easy to give a quick example of each. So, you know, first food service and running, um, that's just, you know, 
one example that I really like here is a firm that we implemented workplace experience with. Um, they never thought to check with meeting organizers, whether it's a client event or an internal event, to make sure that dietary restrictions were being followed. There's nothing worse than having a participant of your meeting show up who just literally cannot have gluten and there's nothing for them to eat. All of a sudden, they have to run downstairs, go to a you know corner store and find something that they can munch on for an hour. Um, it, it's not a good experience for that visiting client or professional, and it's not the right way to treat your guests. So that's something that we you know pay attention to when it comes to food and service. You know, loyalty cards. Not that you know I was talking about the JW and the Ritz. This is actually a thing. Um, rewarding compliance whether it's a three-day work week, a four-day work week in the office, rewarding that compliance with programs that give perks. And most of the time, it's associated with those bottom two bullets, you know, better parking spaces or a better bonus. Uh, mm-hmm. I work with a couple of firms now who are putting some real teeth behind their uh, mandates to return to the office. And if you don't reach a certain percentage, your bonus is cut. Um, it's, it's not a popular thing to, you know, crack that whip, but they don't, they, they just really don't know what else to do. Um, you know, having things like petty cash around, that is really just about giving your support staff the ability to do the right thing at the right time. You know, if, if somebody, you know, needs an umbrella, just give it out, spill on your shirt, we can go out and get you one, um, last minute client request. God knows there's a lot of them. So there's that, uh, Floor hosts, which, you know, we refer, I've probably used a couple of different terms already, but floor ambassadors, floor hosts, WPX associates, that is just creating the reality of support at a moment's notice. You can always flag somebody down. Somebody's always there waiting to help you. Um, The same goes for supporting VIPs. You have to be able to train your receptionist and your hospitality professionals to handle your VIPs. If you have a lateral partner coming in who's potentially going to join the firm, you want to make sure that they have the best experience possible. Um, And we do all of these things on behalf of our clients. And, you know, finally, uh, quiet and focused spaces. Even though, you know, people are typically coming in nowadays to connect with people, they still have some of that focus work that needs to be done. So having staff available who can reset those rooms, make sure they're configured correctly for whatever meeting is happening, um, that is incredibly important. Um, I know there is a double up of a certain bullet here, and that is uh, a barista copy and grape copy. Take it from me. Uh, it is the most popular thing we have done in most client sites in the last you know 12 to 24 months. When the barista is out, people are losing their minds. So it, that works. If you take nothing else away from my portion of this webinar, get get a barista. But um, you know, but as, as you can tell, you know, the main idea of what I had today is that people are what makes a difference when it comes to the service. Um, Ashley, this is your cue. I know you're going to talk a little bit about presence. Yes. Yeah. Thanks, Nick. And really, it's a great segue because presence is all about people. So presence, essentially at its core, it's a piece of technology. I can explain how it works later. But what it does is it shows who's in the office right now. And it does that automatically without any clicks. And so I think that's really a key point because it enables visibility into an office very easily. So I can pull out my phone. I can see who's in this Lincoln, Nebraska office I'm in right now. I can see who's in the Alpharetta office. I can see who's working in Seattle. You know, I can see those things really, really quickly. Maybe I'm actually going to be visiting the Alpharetta office and I want to see who's there and I've never been there. I need to be able to see who's there, who I can use as a resource and really have that core visibility. So that's what presence is. Presence is showing who's in the office right now. Now you can take presence a whole nother to a whole, I would just say other realm uh, to make it be kind of the tool for hybrid. And how you do that is you say, who's in the office right now? Who's planning to be in the office, but has not yet arrived? And then how do I utilize my space properly based on all of that information? So we're going to talk a little bit about that. I'm going to show you a few slides that just kind of represent this. Some of you use presence. Some of you know um, presence at its core, the things it's great for. I think most people would say it is the people part. And so what you're seeing here is actually some really 
great data from the survey I referenced earlier today. And what this data tells us, you can read all of the percentages and the numbers, but what it tells us is the greater use of presence technology increases actual in-office presence. So essentially we're saying if there is some sort of presence technology saying I'm in the office or I'm having to do something to say I'm going to be in the office, chances are I'm actually going to appear in the office. So I'm sharing with my peers that I'm going to be in. I'm sharing with my department. I'm sharing with my leaders that I'm going to be in. I'm probably going to make every effort to be in or at least let them know that I'm not. And so that's what our data is showing here. You're seeing 96.2%. And we call this the reservation to presence ratio. That just means that I'm taking it a step further. And I'm saying, you may have your own office. We don't even have to talk about hoteling, but you're going to book into your own office or somebody's going to do it on your behalf so that we know when you're planning to be in. And we're saying that as you kind of work down this graph here and all of these data points, that the more often that somebody says, I'm going to be in, I will be in. And so as we take this another step further, we're going to talk about the focus on people. Um, so I like to kind of break this in two sometimes. We want presence and you want presence to encourage people to be back in the office. That's what we're trying to do. We, we want people to be back in the office. That doesn't mean five days a week. It could. It may mean two days a month. It's whatever you decide as an organization you want it to mean. So we want to encourage that. We want to provide this ability to encourage that. The second part of that is, let's pretend that we've we've encouraged, people are doing it, it's working, and now I'm two years down the road, even six months, six months to two years. Now I have all of this data telling me, this is how my employees actually interacted in the spaces in which we occupy. So they're saying now, I, I did come in two days a month. I did come in five days a week. Whatever the case may be, could be different by location. I'm saying as an administrator within a particular company that this is how we're actually using our space. Now, two things can happen at that point. Many things, but at a high level. I can completely reevaluate my space now. I don't need as much space as I have. That's what's happening most of the time right now um, with our clients is they don't need as much space. So now I have data to support my new builds and my new office spaces or my current space and reconfiguring it to have more opportunities for collaboration spaces or hoteling seats or whatever the case may be. The other thing that can happen with all of this is that your employees actually do feel more engaged. It's, I would never tell you that software does everything. I think that software enables a lot of things. And so what you get with presence is you get two things. You get clear data to make clear, precise decisions that are data-driven, and you get people who are more engaged. I think that's what presence does. How it works, you can email me at the end and we can talk through that. Uh, but those are what we're trying, those are kind of the two things we're trying to do with presence. So as we move on here, you're going to see reports and analytics, which are incredibly important. So with our tool and many other tools, by the way, you may be using other tools, there should be, there is, in our case, several reports that help you make those decisions. So with over 50 reports, we come up with more every day just because of how this space is evolving and how people are using their spaces and the things that are important to them. Many of you on the call, the reason I, I said we come up with many every day, I feel like, is because some of you requested those and then everybody else uses them because as this model evolves, it changes and, and we have new data and we have new needs for data. And so what we're seeing here is this is really confirming our assumptions or it's helping us adjust for new norms. And so it's, it's one thing to be able to book a seat. I could book a seat, I could create an app real quick, book a seat, use Outlook, whatever I want to do. It's another thing to do it very intentionally, do it intentionally with data on the other side to actually drive business forward and really be able to say at the end of the day, I spend 10.5% on real estate and I'm okay with that, or I'm not okay with that. And here's what we're going to do about it. So next, I have a couple of things that I just want to, we're going to start bringing this all together, the whole services and technology thing. But first I want to talk about the use of software to prompt action. So Nick kind of, anybody who knows me on this call knows that if you say something about coffee, I'm probably going to have a comment about it. Um, so having a barista, you know, in the office, you may want to announce that. You may want to say in our Seattle office today, we're going to have the best coffee. We're going to have Starbucks. It's not the best coffee, but since we're talking about Seattle, we could announce those things very easily within Maptician. And so when we say people prompt action, I mean that 
we are saying I could be coming into an office and the person, the concierge or the person on that floor who's leading may not know initially all the things about me that I love, but they could learn, they could be told, they could put it in an application. And when I walk in the door, they could say, she loves coffee and people, which I think is what is on the screen, something along those lines. Um, so there's a lot of ways that you can prompt action. And it really, at the end of the day, just looks like it was the human that did it, which is great. The human part is most important. So technology is just really helping with that. There's a thing that we keep talking about too. It's just like the surprise moments. There's an example we're going to talk about here in a second, but I walk in the door and you know that I love coffee. You know that I want to be by a window. You know that I love people and you know that I'm going to be in a conference room for nine hours a day and you make that happen for me. Chances are I want to come back. And so technology can support all of what I just listed. And so as we kind of go through some different examples here, um, we're going to, I think, if I can get this on cue, we're going to actually bring it all together. And I get to talk about Nick's idea. This was his diagram that Trish and team executed. Um, but I think it truly is a sweet spot. And so I really do love this. I do want to bring it together because I think there are a lot of things we can do together. Of course, technology can stand on its own. Of course, Forest can stand on its own with services. We just think that there are opportunities and kind of going forward into the future where we can bring it all together. You're going to see us like actually bring it all together in the very last slide, but I want to at least talk to you about some scenarios first that are kind of interesting. They're real scenarios. They're things that have happened with our clients. And so I want to talk through that. So here, we're going to talk about a law firm and a non-law firm. So you're going to have to work with me. I told Ala on our team, you know, storytelling, like I love to talk obviously, but there's storytelling is kind of a little bit of a, a new thing to me. So you got to kind of think here about two things. So we're talking about an actual law firm, an AMLAW 200 law firm. This office that we started with was in Denver and it was going fully hoteling. So, and to Nick's point, call it whatever you want. Like hoteling is the evil word, reservable, reservable seats, whatever. Um, but that's what they were doing. And if you think about it in that scenario, this was last year, they had actually been remote for the two years prior to that. So not only am I going into an entirely new model, I'm going to be the attorney in a second. I am actually going into an entirely new office with entirely new service providers. Everything's new. Um, there's nothing that was the same. So you're rocking my world a lot. I've been working from home. I've been doing my thing from home, but now you want to see me and I'm going into this brand new environment. So I'm the attorney. I walk into the office. There's this new, wonderful concierge person at the front desk. And Nick and team have very great names for that. So concierge person is not what you call them. I know. <laughs> um, but you have this person at the front desk and it's a new person to you probably in this scenario it was. And they offer to take you to your desk that you booked. They offer to grab the coffee for you on the way to your desk. They know what I talked about earlier, that I love a window seat and I love coffee. And they knew that when I walked right in that door. And so not only do they know exactly who's coming into the office today, they knew I was coming in because I, I told them I was coming in or my legal assistant told them I was coming in. And not only that, mm -hmm. they knew everything about me, even though I had no clue who they were. And I was amazed. I'm an attorney who's amazed. And now I will for sure come back. Hey, okay, Nick, you went off yeah. mute. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, good, good eye. Uh, yeah, this is something that we're seeing more and more across you know, several industries, predominantly in legal, that firms are beginning to reimagine their space, probably in conjunction with their lease being up. And Everybody understands the importance of making a splash, making the best first impression possible with people who don't necessarily want to be out of the downtown area. For example, we've got one client who's moving out of a very, very busy, congested downtown area to a more suburban environment. Uh, and they understand that the luxuries need to follow uh, to win people over. And the idea of marrying the technology with the services is on point, actually. Uh, it, it, it is so important to not only stick the landing in terms of that, that person's first 15, 20 minute experience in the office, but to also document all of their preferences going forward. Uh, it, it's something that we're paying very close attention to. And we, we present that option to every client that we begin working with. Oh, that's great. 
I love that. And we're doing the same. I mean, and I know we, we share mutual clients and uh, I think that that's just really important that, you know, we obviously have our lanes, but they do intersect. And I think that we can make them both better. So the other example is quite different. And I'm actually going to roll through this. Of course, you know, some people on the call are not surprised that I um, am going over here, but um, the 7,000 person publicly traded company, totally different, uh, has a brand new office in a location. And, and I happen to be in that office right now. And nobody really had been in the office for a while after this new build, um, post pandemic and everything like that. So then fast forward to March of 22, the years are all blurring together. Now everybody in this area is supposed to come back to the office. Communications have went out, all the things that are proper in this scenario that we've all learned happened. Now, what I will tell you with this is that services was facilities. So facilities can absolutely be the service provider. They could be an outsourced facilities person. They can be an inside person. And I think facilities in this particular case played a key role because they were there. They were ready. The conference room I'm in right now, for example, had no clue how to get some of this stuff connected. They were here. And so I think just having those people on the ground and ready was super important in this case. I will say that there was a little ambiguity about what the actual expectations were. And so naturally us as the Maptician company, kind of in the middle of all of this happening, you know, they're coming to us and be like, what should we do? What should we do? And I'm like, our tool can do anything, but you've got to make sure you know exactly what you want your people to do. And so really making sure that that's all defined and everything was really, really important. Now I will say that naturally the anchor days, we haven't talked a lot about this, but anchor days, a little buzzy right now, you know, Nick and I have our thoughts on buzzy terms, but um, anchor days are a thing. And um, I will say that usually it's Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, one of those days and it may not be every week but anyway that's naturally happening and we have the data to support that in this particular scenario it has not been mandated that those are anchor days now what has been happening are a lot of talks like talks and inner talkings or inner workings within the organization about this and i do think that we'll get there with some of the more we are doing this certainly with the higher level people now there's somebody on the call that once uh, said on another call. <laughs> um, it's, you know, kind of the people who are really digging into the careers, you know, not just the jobs, you know, that's also very buzzy. But I think that that actually is what we're hearing is that there are uh, in office presence is actually driving bonuses, it's driving roles, it's driving a lot of different things right now. So I mention it in this scenario because I've heard all of that in this space. And I do think in future webinars and future conversations with many of you, we'll have some hard data to support some of those things, just like we've now had more data to support a lot of what we're saying. Now, bringing it truly together, um, moving on here, we are actually getting ready to open a New York City showroom. Um, so very excited about this in the Forest headquarters in New York City. Uh, we are actually going to have every piece of Maptician technology. Forest has been utilizing it for a while, um, but we are gonna have every application available in the New York City showroom. So if you ever want to pop in and talk to the Forest team, I'm happy to fly there anytime, gonna be there in two weeks. Um, we can walk you through and kind of tour and show you the space, um, what it may look like to work with Forest and Maptician and have kind of these things all together. So really bringing that in-office presence to real life with services and technology in the New York space. So very excited about that. All right, we made it. Q and A. <laughs> we did it. You're, I you're think we do. We do have some questions coming in. Oh, yeah. Let's see here. I see Vicky. Hey, Vicky. Long time no chat. Let's see here. I'm joking. Um, on one hand, having this software could lead to savings in real estate, but on the other hand, I feel the firm will have to spend more money on that VIP treatment, which is a great idea, but I'm not sure firms will want to spend more money just to bring people in. Are there any existing stats on that? And hello to you too. Um, you know, I think the, and Nikki may have some thoughts on this. I don't have a stat I could rattle off right now, but I do have pure actual examples of this working and them being in the works right now. I do think firms will spend money on it. I think firms want people in the office. Um, I think that that varies by firm. And I do think that they would spend money on it. But, you know, it's yeah. I have a handful of examples in my head right now. 
Nick? Yeah, Vicky, Vicky, nice to meet you. Um, there are obviously varying degrees at which you can jump into the waters of workplace experience. We've had some firms who have come to us and they say, we want to add headcount on literally every floor of every office that we have because the experience to them is that important. Other firms say, you know, can you give us a slightly watered down version of this? And that usually includes cross training existing roles like reception, hospitality, office services to serve in the workplace experience model. So every every employee that Forest Solutions puts on site with any client goes through two stages of workplace experience training. It's 1.0 and 2.0. So this is for us as an organization, it is our major focus going forward for the next decade, putting, putting this level of service on site as frequently as possible. And even, even if you're not signing up for the blue chip version of you know, us pulling a concierge away from the Ritz-Carlton and putting them in your office, uh, the people who are supporting your firm in other capacities will have these skill sets. And it's incremental, just like I said before. Um, everything that we do is available in smaller doses. Um, I gave you a couple of uh, heavy examples, but I'd love to chat. All right. Any other questions that we missed? Oh, looks like somebody. No, she said I she'll go to the Ritz every, every day. day. <laughs> Me too. Let's go together. <laughs> All right. This is wonderful. All right, Trish, anything else on your side? I think that's a wrap on uh, the session today. Um, there were a couple of questions. Uh, people wanting uh, the slides after uh, the recording today and yes we'll send the slides we'll send the recording out to everybody so you'll have access to all of this fabulous information thank you so much nick and ashley you guys were amazing your contact information is up here and thank you so much everybody for attending everybody thank you. have a great it was day fun. <laughs>